This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir has arrived at Cairo's airport. This is his second international visit since the warrant for his arrest has been announced by the ICC. President Hosni Mubarak welcomed him in the Egyptian presidential palace, and both presidents refused to talk to the press. They had a joint meeting regarding the complicated situation in Sudan that resulted due to the crisis in Darfur and the ICC's warrant to arrest al-Bashir. تأتي زيارة الرئيس السوداني المرتقبة إلى مصر في عقاب زيارة قام بها إلى إريتريا يوم الاثنين الماضي. The Sudanese president's visit to Egypt came right after his visit to Eritrea on Monday, in which he challenged his arrest warrant. President Al Bashir took a risk and traveled outside of Sudan regardless of the religious decree that was announced by the Muslim scholars in Sudan asking him not to travel outside of the country. The observers do not expect that Al Bashir would be arrested in Cairo because Cairo has a close relationship with Khartoum. Furthermore, Egypt was not a member of the Rome Agreement in which the foundation of the ICC was based upon. Prominent Egyptian leaders have expressed their frustration concerning the ICC's decision. Egyptian Foreign Minister Ahmad Abu al Ghait issued a warning regarding the negative consequences that may result due to the ICC's decision. Al Bashir's arrest remains a possibility. Many believe believe that rerouting his flight to a country that observes the ICC's rulings and arresting him is a very possible scenario. Ahmad Haroun, the State Minister of Humanitarian Affairs in Sudan, is also wanted by the ICC, and they have previously tried to arrest him by rerouting his flight. An ICC spokeswoman has revealed the plan that was made by the ICC a few months ago to reroute the flight that was taking Haroun to Saudi Arabia and force it to land in a country where they can arrest him. However, the plan failed when Haroun canceled his travel after he was warned. The ICC prosecutor has been exerting a lot of effort to execute the warrant for al-Bashir's arrest. It was said that the purpose of his most recent visit to the U.S. was to encourage Washington to take practical steps to abduct President al-Bashir and hand him over to the ICC if he attends the summit in Doha at the end of the month. This visit came at the same time that al-Bashir was visiting Eritrea. The Americans do not seem to be encouraged about this. The spokesman for the U.S. Foreign Ministry, Robert Wood, said that Washington is not legally obligated to arrest al-Bashir. We will talk to Al Jazeera bureau chief in Cairo, Hussein Abdel Ghani. Hussein Abdel Ghani in Cairo will update us about the most recent details concerning Al Bashir's visit. Please, Hussein, go ahead. I believe that President Mubarak made sure to welcome the Sudanese president to reiterate Egypt's continuous support to Sudan through this crisis. This support is due to Sudan and Egypt's common interests when it comes to the depth of the Egyptian national security in Sudan and vice versa. Egypt is also completely dependent on the Nile water that flows through Sudan. These developments in the Sudanese-Egyptian relations are not something new. 
for Egypt has endlessly tried to stop the warrant for al-Bashir's arrest. The Egyptian Minister of Intelligence met with American officials while on visit that lasted for several days to show Egypt's continuous efforts. While on his visit, Minister Omar al-Suleiman expressed Egypt's security concern, since this decision might create more instability in Sudan. He also told the American officials that this kind of attempt will increase the anger in the Arab streets towards the U.S. and neutral Arab countries, especially after the most recent Israeli war on Gaza. I would like to welcome from Khartoum Sudan's Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Mr. Ahmed Haroun. Haroun, who is a senior official from the Sudanese ruling party, is the number one suspect of the International Court of Justice. He is being accused of committing war crimes in the region of Darfur, west of Sudan. The International Court of Justice didn't only name Haroun as a suspect in the genocide case of Darfur, but also named his head of state, Omar al-Bashir, as well. The war crime allegations against al-Bashir have thrown the world's diplomacy, including that in the Arab world, off balance. While some believe that the issue can still be resolved through diplomatic means, others believe it's beyond redemption. Mr. Minister, welcome to the program. Thank you for agreeing to come on the show. We hope that you can answer some of the difficult questions freely and with an open mind. I would like to start off by asking you about the official position adopted by the Khartoum authorities. Do you feel that Sudan is facing a major crisis? Are you worried about what's going on? We're not worried about what's going on. This is a new way to try to get back at Sudan. This time they have disguised themselves behind the fake mask of justice. This fake justice will continue to play out as this is not the first or final episode. God willing, we will continue to move forward with a great deal of confidence. Mm. In your opinion, is it possible to drop the charges against the Sudanese head of state in a way of a deal? We started to hear that a deal is being formulated, perhaps with Ahmed Haroun as a scapegoat. Do you think that Sudan or the head of the Sudanese regime is willing to sacrifice you as a scapegoat? These words or concepts don't exist in our political dictionary. We didn't join the government for political gains or out of greed. However, we joined the ruling party because we share the same ideology and have the same mission. Therefore, these types of deals may happen in other countries, but definitely not in Sudan. We share the same ideology, and this is what brought us together. To those who are betting on our failure, I would like to tell them simply, you don't know us very well. There appears to be rumors spreading about the possibility of retrying you before the Sudanese courts. You may have read it in the newspapers. Are these news reports true or staged? You've already described such news as rumors. Having said that, they are merely rumors and have no truth in them. So there will not be any trials, and you will continue to move in the same direction as Sudan. Yes, we will continue to move in that direction because it's the only path that conforms with the ordinary state of affairs in the country. During armed conflicts, issues like these can't be resolved in the chamber of the International Court of Justice. The normal way of thinking is to resolve such issues through political agreements and through reconciliation efforts. Then the issue of accountability can come to play 
place, but only when deemed necessary. This is what we have learned from past international and national experience, especially from armed conflicts around the world, with some being more ferocious and complicated than that of Darfur. Those who are trying to promote justice at the expense of peace are simply trying to throw the Sudanese state of affairs off balance. They want to create a new political equation in order to derail the peace process and keep Sudan in an ongoing state of war. On the second day of the assassination of top Palestinian official Kamal Madhat and his companions, the families of the martyred received condolences. Meanwhile, the crime scene was tampered with after parts of the exploded car were removed. The crime scene where top Fatah leader has been assassinated along with three of his companions was left unsecured pending the formation of an investigative committee. Meanwhile, the Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas said that he will send a special follow-up committee to join the investigation. Work resumed in the crater, which was caused by the explosion, in order to stop the flow of water due to broken pipes. The roads leading to and from the camp were reopened as life started to return to normal. At the crime scene, the victim's car was dismantled and sold in parts at the camp. During the process of dismantling the car, much of the evidence, including the flesh of the four slain officials, has been contaminated. No one knows why the crime scene was left unsecured. The families of the two martyrs, Major General Akram Daher and Mohammed Mohammed Shehada held a memorial service a few kilometers away from the scene of the explosion where they received condolences. The two slain generals were on a Palestinian reconciliation mission with Kamal Medhat in the Meya Meya refugee camp. <laughs> they are honorable people. They are the children of Yasser Arafat. They are the children of Palestine, and Palestine must mourn their loss. Everyone in Palestine, young and old, must mourn them. They are from the same generation of Yasser Arafat, and they grew up with him. They are not bad people, and they are not traitors. They have defended the Palestinian plight all their life. This is why they have to pay the ultimate price. On God we rely, all praise to him. One day before he was killed, he asked me to pray for him. I asked God to direct and lead him to the right path. Then he left and never returned. That was it. Thank God. <laughs> who do you think has killed him? The traitors who work on behalf of Israel. I heard the sound of an explosion. Then I saw thick smoke. Where were you? I was close from my home. I saw smoke. I called Akram's cell phone, but I didn't get a signal. Then I realized that Akram had been martyred. Did you expect something like this would happen to him? No. I thought we would have a long life together. We had a dream that one day we would return to the Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital. He'd always hoped to be buried in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the local authorities in Sidon are conducting an initial investigation under the supervision of the state prosecutor of the military court, Judge Sakir Sakir, who filed the case against anonymous persons. The case was transferred to the first military investigative judge. At the time, the Arab foreign ministers were finishing their final statement on terrorism. Terrorism hit in the heart of the Palestinian home. This is a message to whom it may concern. The Palestinian front is open to all possibilities and the Arab security is at risk. From the Meya Meya camp, Ibrahim Desouki, New TV. The Palestinian factions met in the Ain el Helwe refugee camp. They condemned the criminal assassination and held Israel and its collaborators responsible for the crime. Amidst the atmosphere of the Nauru celebration and as the members of the Nur convoy continue their tour of the southern Iranian regions, rest areas open their doors to offer them free services.
Today is the fourth day of the Noor convoy's visit to the sacred defense areas. University students here requested to visit the Fekka crossing on the Iranian-Iraqi border, where the remnants of war remain. Photographs of those who left this area as martyrs makes it feel like their spirits are still here. We and the Noor convoy left to return towards the capital, Tehran. However, we made an unexpected stop with a model of the free rest areas which welcome the Noor convoy. Prayers for Muhammad and Muhammad's family are the price that visitors have to pay to use the rest area and receive its services. The rest area not only offers tea, juices and food, but also provides other services to the travelers. Here we help them with providing dinner, free services for the sake of God and for the martyrs, for the sake of the blood of the martyrs so that martyrs can rest in peace. What distinguishes this rest area is that it was the first free rest area that was set up at the start of the war and remains in place today. However, what is different between these two periods, the period of war and the period of peace? During the war, the visitors of the area were from Mukat in Afkat. Now the visitors of the rest area are friends and families of the martyrs who did not take part in the war. They come to visit the place where the martyrs lived. Memorabilia include the Holy Quran, prayer beads, and the like, which are given to visitors to this rest area in exchange for nothing except for prayers from Muhammad and his family. The free rest area, or as it is called here, the prayer rest area, is a phenomenon that was created during the time of the Iraq-Iran War. The war has ended, but the phenomenon has continued to this day. Nizar al-Nidawi, al-Alam, from the Husseini area, southern Iran. جنوبی ایران Assad Abdun is an Iraqi doctor living abroad. He heads one of the departments in California Pacific Hospital in the U.S. Dr. Abdun, who specializes in organ transplant surgery, successfully carried out very difficult medical surgeries upon his return. One operation included the removal of a dangerous tumor from the liver of a young woman in Karbala. More details with Majid al kateb he is an Iraqi doctor who lives in America and heads a department in California Pacific Hospital. He specializes in organ transplant surgery for the liver, kidney and pancreas. He has won many international awards in his field. He recently returned to Iraq as a way to show his love for his country. He shares his expertise with Iraqi doctors and the ill who need his medical skill the most. Some surgeries we have conducted include the removal of tumors from the stomach, kidneys, colon and intestines. In one surgery in Al-Hila, we removed the whole tumor and conducted other appendix-related surgeries. Here we removed tumors from the left part of the kidney. We did several surgeries. Dr. Assad came to Karbala in coordination with the Bani Thamar Hospital, where many difficult operations are conducted. God willing, a number of these surgeries will be conducted by him. Samaher suffered from a tumor in her kidney, which put her life at risk. The visit of Dr. Assad brought happiness to her heart and high hopes for recovery. With teary eyes, she asked all Iraqi doctors to return home. Layla Sawahir lives in Najaf. She has a tumor in the left part of her kidney. Her operation is difficult and it needs a specialized medical team and a great deal of resources. We took advantage of the fact that Dr. Assad is here.
He's one of the best doctors in America. He expressed willingness to conduct this surgery, and God willing, he will. I hope that Iraqi doctors return and perform these kinds of surgeries. They told me if the tumor stays in my body, I will die. I hope that all Iraqi doctors return to their country and help their people because we are in great need. Regardless of how far the Iraqi people travel and regardless how successful they become, they always think of the day when they return home. They always long for the land of the two rivers. Richard Holbrook, who is the U.S. Special Envoy, has already pointed to Afghanistan's border with Pakistan as the key to restoring any semblance of stability. But as Kamal Haider reports from Islamabad, the Pakistani government has little control in the border areas. Washington is saying that there must be an American exit strategy from Afghanistan in place, and at the same time discusses the possibility of widening U.S. drone attacks within Pakistan proper including targeting Quetta in Balochistan province. Whatever happens, the next few months will be critical for Pakistan. Its government is accused of not governing at all, having lost control of a huge area along its common border with Afghanistan. Defense analysts say the conflict in Pakistan could get worse. There are fears that it could become a failed state, a real concern for the international community for a country with a nuclear weapons arsenal. Let me tell you, whatever trouble of suicide bombing and all that is in Pakistan, it is precisely because of the perception that Pakistan is fighting America's war on terror. The country's northwest frontier province is already in a state of war. Pakistan's military fears it could be sucked into a quagmire there from which it will be difficult to extract itself. They have already suffered high casualties since the country began supporting the United States in the so-called war on terror. Dubai Port's international growth rate in 2008 was 45% higher than that of 2007. The company made this announcement today and explained that it has generated $621 million in profits in 2008 after taxes. The company's revenue was $3 billion and $280 million, 20% more than that of 2007. The executive director of Dubai Ports, Mohammed Sharaf, said that the company is reviewing some of its planned expansion projects which may be postponed until the global financial crisis is over due to a decrease in the volume of products being transported through international ports starting from the fourth quarter of 2008 until now. The tourism sector in Dubai is in good shape despite the international financial crisis. Dubai's tourism sector was spared the effects of the crisis through special measures. These were the words of the executive director of tourism and marketing department in Dubai, Kamis bin Harab. He added that Dubai provided incentives for tourists and organized new tourism programs in order to maintain the growth rate of the tourism sector in Dubai. Bin Harab also said that hotels in Dubai have generated the highest revenue among all other hotels in the world during the month of January. Thank God the average occupancy rate during the last period was more than 80 percent. This shows that the tourism sector in Dubai is still strong and that it still generates high revenues. In the last week of February, the occupancy rate at Al Shati hotels in Dubai was 95 percent, and in Al Madena hotels it was between 76 and 80 percent. These are great percentages. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East.
The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.